Welcome to this course. My name is Happy and I am a software consultant and trainer with more than 13 years of experience. I have given and taken more than 100 interviews in my career. Here I am going to share the top 25 interview questions asked from SQL Server. If you are already giving interviews then you can easily recognize that these are some of the very important questions in SQL Server. We will cover similar 25 questions in this video. You can find the list of all the questions in the description box. This is the topic SQL. Here we will cover some basic questions about SQL which every candidate should know. Here is the list of the questions and the approx duration of all these questions is around 20 minutes. So let's start with the first question. What is the difference between DBMS and RDBMS? It is not a very important question, but it is a very basic question which every person should know. Let's check out the differences. Here are the differences between DBMS and RDBMS. DBMS stands for Database Management System and RDBMS stands for Relational Database Management System. DBMS stores data as file RDBMS store data in tabular form. DBMS there is no relationship between data. In RDBMS data is related to each other via foreign key relationship. In normal DBMS there is no normalization present. In RDBMS normalization is there. Normally DBMS deals with a small quantity of data. While RDBMS deal with large amount of data. Normal DBML example is XML. You can save data in XML format also. Our DBMS example is MySQL, PostgreSQL, SQL Server, Oracle, Microsoft Access, etc. So basically, the databases which we use, like SQL Server, are relational database management system. They are our DBMS. What is a constraint in SQL? What are its types? It is a very important question and very important concept in SQL Server. In simple English, SQL constraints are used to specify rules for the data in a table. Constraints are used to limit the type of data that can go into a table. Let's see the types of constraints. See, here we are creating a student table and applying all the types of constraints in it. So, as I said, constraint is apply on the data. What kind of data will be there in the table? What is the data type of that data? So, this is the constraint. So, let's check out the type of constraints. First is primary key constraint. Primary key is a field which can you uniquely identify each row in a table. So I hope you are already aware about primary key. So here is the primary key constraint. So we have applied primary key constraint on this ID column. Second one is not null constraint. It tells that we cannot store a null value in a column. So here in the second column, no, we have applied not null so this name column cannot be null at any point of time if you will try to insert a null value in this then it will not allow it and will throw an error a type of constraint is foreign key constraint so which is basically foreign key is a field which can uniquely identify each row in another table so foreign key is a relationship of one table with the other table so here this student table is related to this courses table so every student will have a course and the course id is present here and the foreign key is the course id from the courses table so these two tables students and courses are interlinked through this foreign key next type of constraint is check constraint so check is basically to validate the values of a column to meet a particular condition. So 
here we have applied that the value of age will always be greater than equal to 18. So if you will try to enter anything below 18 like 17, 16, 13, then this will not allow this and it will give an error. So that is the check constraint. Next one and the last, oh sorry, the fifth one is default constraint. Default constraint specifies a default value for the column where no value is specified by the user. So suppose we have this admission date column and you will put a constraint default get date. Then whenever you will insert any value in this row and if you will not provide the value of this admission date, then it will automatically pick this get date, the current date for this default because this is a default value for this admission date column so that is the admission date last constraint we have is the unique constraint and as its name suggests that all the values of this unique constraint will be unique there are some difference between unique and primary key which will which we will discuss in next question uh, upcoming question so that are the types of constraints this again which are the rules applied for the data in a table so all these constraints are basically handling the data in the table now what is the difference between primary key and unique key first thing and the first difference is Primary key cannot accept null values. Unique key can accept null values but only one. Remember only one null value is, uh, is allowed in a unique key. Second difference is when you create a primary key then it will automatically set the clustered index on it. Whereas that is not the case with unique key. So it will not set any clustered index you can you have to set non clustered index manually on it third difference is only one primary key is possible in a table while more than one unique key are possible in a table so these are the three differences between primary key and unique key Before proceeding to next question, here is an announcement for you. If you are looking for a complete course on .NET interview, then here it is. This course contains 500 interview questions on topics OOPS, C-Sharp, .NET, MVC, Web API and .NET Core. You will also get this ebook with this course, which will help you in revising the things really fast. If you want to try it, then the course link is given in the description. If not, then it is completely fine. You can continue with this course only. And I wish you all the best for your interview. So let's just continue with the next question. Explain triggers and types of triggers. Triggers, here is the definition. Triggers are stored programs which are automatically executed or fired when some event occur. So let's try to understand with the help of an example. Suppose you have a table locations that changes frequently. Now you want to know how many times and when these changes are happening in this table uh, locations. In that case, you can create a trigger that will insert the desired data or you can say the history data into another table location history whenever any change in the main table will occur. So whenever any change will happen in the locations table, a trigger will be fired which will automatically insert some data in the location history. And you need not to manually write the query to insert the data in the location history table. So that is the role of the trigger. See, here I have written the trigger for the same locations and location history example. See, this is the trigger name pr underscore update underscore locations this is the table name here locations 
it is a kind of update uh, trigger because if there is any update will happen at location table then the value will be inserted in the location history table here see and here is the logic insert logic we have so whenever there uh, will be any update in the location table a trigger will be fired which name is tr underscore update underscore location and this logic will be executed and this logic will insert into location history select location id which is uh, just inserted in the location table and the date from inserted so this is the trigger example now how many types of trigger are there so these are the types of triggers remember these ddl dml and log are category of triggers but the type of triggers are instead of after triggers insert update delete and after triggers are also of insert update delete so uh, this after trigger we just discussed here so this is the after triggering example see after trigger and it is the update update because we are doing operation when there is any update will happen in the locations table so if there is any insert will happen in locations table then the trigger will be insert trigger if there will be any delete then that will be delete trigger so now this is after trigger now what is instead of trigger so in after trigger update on table executed first and then the trigger will run so here is the example of instead of trigger so in case of instead of trigger if you will try to insert a row into a table or example the same locations table so instead of inserting the row in that table it will not allow your trigger will not allow the insert into that table and then it will insert uh, the law the row in some other table that is as per your logic if you don't want to insert into some other table that is also fine but instead of means the main insert on locations table will not be allowed so the definition is and instead of trigger is a trigger that allows you to skip it will skip the insert delete update statement on a table which is locations here or a view and execute other statement defined in the trigger instead so it will execute this statement whatever written here so this is instead of trigger uh, it is the use case is suppose there is a view which is just for reading read only purpose but now someone is trying to execute any insert on it uh, so then you can create a trigger as a dba that will skip that insert and trigger will not allow the insert so that will good for the security so that is the answer what is a view this is a very important question and a view is a virtual table which consists of a subset of data contained in a table or more than one table let me show you the diagram here see here we have two physical tables table a and table b and by writing a query uh, and you can say by combining them we are creating a view here which in which the columns can be a combination of the columns of table a and table b so that is view uh, let me show you how to create a view on a table so see here we are creating a view india customers and we are getting customer name and contact name from customers where country in equal to india so it is not necessary that we create view from two tables you can create view on a single table and we just use the filter here so only country equal to india will be the india customers will come here so that is 
uh, an example of the query of the view. Uh, remember, view are not stored in the memory, means the data is never stored like a table. Its view are not physical, but the query is stored. So, why we use views? means what is the reason we use views we can directly use the queries to write to, to get the data so the first reason is views can be indexed very easily and that can improve the performance this is the first reason why we we use views second reason and i think that is the important reason is extra security dba can hide the actual table names and expose views for read operations uh, let me give you example here for example there is a table which data must not be updated by the developers developers can only get data from that table now you are you want to hide that table name from the even developers also because that is a very secure very very secure table you cannot expose its name then what you will do then you can create a view and which name can be anything and then you can write a query inside this view to get data from the that secure table so now your developers will access the view only they will uh, like select a star from view they don't know what is the actual table name you are providing a secure key to the table because you are exposing only the view so in that way table name remains confidential and secured so that is view what is the difference between having clause and where clause again guys i am telling you differences are the best questions for the interviewers because the differences question they can check two concepts at the same time so differences are the important one so this is a very important question now let's check out the differences where clause is used before group by clause so if you can see the query here where condition or clause is used before group by and having clause is used after group by so that is one difference next is where clause cannot contain aggregate function what are aggregate function like this you know i think max sum these are aggregate function and you cannot use them with where clause you can use aggregate functions with having clause like this shown in the query so this is the important difference and this is why we mostly use having uh, because they work with aggregate function so this is the difference between having clause and where clause what is subquery or nested query or inner query in sql uh, first of all all these three things are same subquery nested query and inner query these are same uh, words same 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 thing now a subquery or uh, inner query or nested query is a query within another sql query and embedded within the where clause so let's see the example see here, see here. Uh, this is the outer query okay this is the outer query and here inside the where condition here we are we have this inner query uh, it is that simple so this is the uh, inner query sub query or nested query which is embedded inside the where condition what is auto increment identity column in sql server this is a very basic question Auto, auto increment allows a unique number to be generated automatically when a new record is inserted into a table uh, for example here see the person id is a identity column 
because we have assigned this identity like this here. So you need not to insert any value in this column. It will automatically insert an integer which is plus one from the previous one. So whenever you will insert a new row in this table, then you, you will not to be uh, careful about this uh, person ID column or you can you should not pass any value in this person ID column because it will be automatically get the uh, number which is plus one from the previous number and mostly it is the primary key only this auto increment 99% uh, of cases this will be the primary key so that is auto increment or we can say identity column in SQL server. Now we will cover questions from joins in SQL. Mostly interviewer will ask questions about the joins only. Here is the list of the questions about the joins. The approx duration of all these questions will be around 8 minutes only. So let's start with the first question. What are joins in SQL? This is a very basic and short, short question and my funda is to always start from the basics. So a join is used to combine rows from two or more tables based on a related column between them. So here you can see the diagram where we have two tables, table one and table two and if you will join them, you can get a result which will be like this. So this is the simple join. What are the types of joins in SQL Server? This is a very important question from interview perspective. First is outer join which is of three types. Left outer join. As you can see in the diagram, it returns all the records from the left table and the match records from the right table. So see here in the diagram, we have two tables A and B and we are getting all the records from the first table and see the query here below for the left join select star from table a alias a left join table b b on a dot key so this is the column on which this join has been performed second is also the same but where b dot key is null so we have removed the uh, values which are not common so only exclusive a is present in this left outer join Second type of join is right outer join. Similarly, as you can see in the diagram, it will return all the records from the right table and the matched record from the left table. So it is just opposite of the left join. Left join will give the left table records and the matching records of right table and right table will get the records of the right table and matching records of the left table only. Then we have full outer join, the third type of outer join it is. It will return all the records whether there is a match in the either left or right, all the records will be returned. And if you want to get records, if you don't want to get the records which are common, then you can just use this null query like this. So this is full outer join. The most important one is this inner join which is mostly used for SQL queries because it will return the records that have matching values in both the tables. So see there is A table and B table and they have common values right here in the red part. So only these records will be we will retrieve and the inner join is for this. So that is the types of joins present in SQL Server. What is a self join? Now self join is also a type of join, but it is not like other joins. The definition is self join is a join of a table to itself. Uh, let's see what does it mean and when to use left join. Suppose you have, a, a, have an employee table. Here all the employees with the employee ID are present. 
managers are also employees so managers are also present in this table now most of the employees will have a manager right therefore the same table there will be a manager id which is nothing but the employee id of the manager of that employee so this manager id is the employee id of the manager of this employee so we have we can also maintain this in another table uh, which can be a manager table but here we are trying to explain self join so that's why we have put the manager id in this table only now suppose your task is to get the employee name with his or her manager name so this will be solved by using self join because we don't have any other table here and there is only one table and there is no such column like manager name in this table so how can we get the manager name then this is the query we will use see here we are left joining the employees table with the employees table only so this is self join we are joining and we are using the different alias one is e one is m so that we can uh, identify the difference so if we will self join like this then we will get the e dot first name as employee which will get from the first table and e dot m dot first name as manager which we will get from the second alias from here and the result will be like this employee name and the manager name because we have applied this employee id equal to manager id so that is the example of the self join so see here we were able to get the result from the same table with the help of the self join this is a sql query question write a sql query to fetch all the employees who are also managers suppose you have a employee table here all the employees with their employee id are present managers are also employed so they are also present with their employee id now most of the employee will have a manager therefore in the same table there is a manager id will be there which is nothing but the employee id of the manager of that employee now your task is to get the employee name with his or her manager name so how we will solve this now come to the solution the solution is we will solve this by using self join because we don't have any other table here and there is no such column like manager name so this is how we will solve this see here we have the left join between the tables employee and the again the table employees and we are using the different alias name one is e and one is m so when we will join on m dot employee id equal to e dot manager id this will give the list of the employee first name and the manager first name so what we are trying to do here is if you already know self join then i think uh, you already get it but if you don't know uh, let me repeat this that self join is a type of join where you will join one table with itself uh, so one table is referring here employee so employees table is uh, uh, one table is like employee which will be e and another table will be referred as like manager so you can think about this that we have divided this one table into two table one is e and another one is m and then we are joining now two different table one have this manager table has this employee id and employee table has this manager id so this is how self join work basically we uh, not actually but logically we are breaking this table into two tables one is for employee and then another was is for managers and then we are joining both these tables to get the first name of the employee and first name of the manager and here will be the result you will get
employee name first name is this and manager and his manager name is this now we will cover questions on indexes in sql this is mostly performance related questions we will cover the below questions here which are present in the list the approx duration of all these questions will be around 8 minutes only so let's start with the first question what are indexes in sql server in simple words sql indexes are used in relational database to retrieve data very fast you, or we can say to improve the performance of the queries we apply indexes on the columns it is similar to indexes at the start of the books which purpose is to find a topic quickly a book index is a type of uh, non cluster index uh, sorry not a type it's an example of non cluster index so like we have index in the book similarly we have index in the tables and it will help us to identify where the data position is right now that is the definition of indexes what is clustered index a clustered index defines the order in which the data is physically stored in a table okay now what it means for example uh, it's like a dictionary if you have so you can see here the dictionary screenshot if you have to find a word uh, you know how to find in seconds uh, for example alphabets like b can be clustered index here now you can easily search a word which starts from b so this is the way clustered index are stored now there can be only one clustered index possible in a table like in dictionary you can have items in alphabetic orders only there is no other way uh, you cannot uh, do it like uh, one two three four and no other uh, way is possible so clustered index are physically stored and they are uh, the example is like the dictionary table data can be stored which i already discussed it can be stored only one way and one clustered index per table is possible not more than that in sql server if you set a primary key on a column then it will automatically create a cluster index on that particular column so that is the feature provided by the sql server only uh, because they assume that primary key has to be the cluster index because it is unique it identifies the rows so it will automatically create the cluster index what is non clustered index a non clustered index is stored at one place and table data is stored in other place so this index is not physically stored it is similar to book index the book index is stored at the starting of the book and the book data book content is stored at uh, after that so both are at different places unlike cluster index where both are at same places like in dictionary you have a at the same place and the words uh, below that are also at the same place so it's just like a map this non clustered index which help you to locate the chapters a table can have multiple clustered index in a oh sorry uh, yeah multiple clustered in, in a table so for example uh, some books can have alphabet wise index which can be at the end of the book so we have one index which is uh, like the chapters the table of contents which can be at the front of the book then we can have one more index which is uh, doing uh, which are which are about the alphabets like what are the main words used in the books so this is also a kind of index because here also you have the uh, name of the word and the page number where it is located so there can be more than one possible indexes non cluster indexes possible in the table 
What is the difference between clustered and non-clustered index? This is a very important question again. Uh, now let's see the differences. First is a clustered index defines the order in which data is physically stored in a table. For example, dictionary. See, this B is also a part of the data only. So this is physically stored and this is a type of, uh, this is an example of clustered index and this is the dictionary. On the other hand, a non-clustered index is stored at one place and table data is stored in another place. For example, book index. So, you know, in a book, a book index is stored at the starting of the book and the book data is stored after that. So, they are at two different places. So, similarly happens with non-clustered index. They are at one place and table data is stored at another place. Second difference is a table can have only one clustered index, only one. On the other hand, a table can have multiple non-clustered index. Next difference is clustered index is faster as comparison to the non-clustered index. Non-clustered index is also good sometimes, but it is not faster as much as the clustered index. So you can easily differentiate like how fast is the dictionary and how fast is the non-clustered the book index which is faster. Obviously the dictionary is faster. How to create clustered and non-clustered index in a table? The first thing is about the cluster index is when you will create a primary key constraint a cluster index on the columns on the that column will be automatically created. But if you don't want to create a primary key in your table then how to create the cluster index without the primary key. That is the query here. Create cluster index. You can keep the index name here. The table on which you want to create the cluster index and the column name on which you want to create the cluster index. So this is the query for the cluster index. And this is the query for the non cluster index to create the non cluster index in for, uh, for a column in a particular table. Create non cluster index, index name, table name and column name. So that is the query. It is not that important question, but yes, sometimes uh, anyone can ask that how to create clustered and non clustered index. And like this, you can answer. In which column you will apply the indexing to optimize this query? Sometimes uh, the interviewer asks the question in a smart way and they will not ask you directly what is the clustered index. Rather, they will uh, ask you in which column you will put the clustered index to make this query faster. This is the query, right? We have three columns here. Select ID, class and name. These are the three columns from the table student. So on which column you will apply the index to make this query faster? And the answer is the column after the where condition which is name here. On this column you will apply the clustered index or the non-clustered index. The, if you will apply the index on these columns then uh, that is not good for means that will not uh, give you any good performance that is worthless so always the columns after the where condition has to be indexed to be applied on now we will cover questions on stored procedures functions and some other remaining topics in sql server this is the list of the questions we are going to cover these are very important questions, so please go through it. The approx duration of all these questions will be around 25 minutes only. If at any point you think a question is very easy for you, then just increase the playback speed of the video. So let's start with the first question. What is the difference between a stored procedure and function? At least three. This is a very, very important question in SQL. 
make sure that you can memorize at least three of them so let's start see this is the basic store procedure and here is a user defined function so when we say user defined function basically when we say function it can be of two types user defined function and system defined function normally we refer the functions with the user defined function on, only because system defined function are the function used by sql server and that is not accessible to you or a developer so better is we uh, use the term user defined function now see the differences first difference is sp may or may not return a value but function must return a value so if you can see here this will always return a value see and this stored procedure may or may not return this output so this is the first difference second difference is sp can have input and output parameters but function can have only input parameters so <coughs> you might be aware that stored procedure can have both input and output parameters but uh, output parameters are not possible in function only input parameters will are there in function next difference is we can call function is inside sp but we cannot call sp from a function so if you can write a query here and you can write like select function from so this is possible inside the stored procedure you can write this here but inside the function name you cannot write like a uh, call sp here so that is not possible this is the one difference next difference is we cannot use sp in sql statements like as uh, select insert update delete merge extra but we can use them with function here is the example this fn country is a function and see how we have written it inside an inline query but you cannot replace this fn country with any stored procedure that is not possible and that is the reason why we use functions sometimes because they can be used in the inline queries another difference is we can use try cache at exception handling in stored procedures but we cannot use try cache in functions one more difference is we can use transactions if you are aware about transactions that is good that we can ins use inside the stored procedure but that not possible inside the functions why i am telling this six differences because i want you to remember at least three to four of them because this is a very good uh, important question and for important questions uh, there is a chance for you to create an impression on interviewer by telling them as much as you can so that's why i am sharing the six differences here how to optimize a stored procedure or sql query this is a performance related question uh, let me show you the screenshot here when you run a insert or update query in sql server like this then you will see these messages one rows affected one row affected like this so inside a sp when you are writing any sp there is no need to show these messages because anyway they are occupying some memory might be very little but yes so one way is to set the no count on might be you have seen it at many places so it will basically not show these messages it will setting no count on no count this is the count and it will be not uh, execute in your stored procedure if you will set this statement at the top second way to optimize a stored procedure is whenever you are writing any query specify the columns names instead of using a strict in select a statement so avoid select star from right select column a column b from like this 
the next way to improve the performance of your stored procedure is use schema name before dbo objects or table names for example if you have a employee table then dbo is the schema which is the most common schema or you might be have any other schema as per your project so use it before the table name because if you have more than one schema then this query will check in all the schema that where, where is this table and that is again not good for performance next is do not use dynamic queries they are vulnerable to sql injections dynamic queries are runtime queries i can uh, this is a different topic although but uh, if you know about them this can be a point that do not use dynamic queries because somebody from the outside can write can insert these dynamic queries in via the sql injections next is use exists uh, you have might have seen like if exists this statement uh, in lot of stored procedure so instead of using count use if exists so this is the wrong way select count one from db you employ and then you will uh, check rather use this technique if select one from db one employees so use exist instead of count then use transaction when required only transactions are basically to maintain uh, that all the statements inside the transaction are must execute or none of them execute so you are if you are writing a transaction statement and inside this transaction between the begin and end if there are three statements uh, all of these three statements will execute or none of these three statements are executed that is a good practice but use them only when required if it is not required do not use them in your stored procedure uh, there are many more things for performance but i am keeping it short and crisp for now uh, because getting into the details is not good from interview point of view what is a cursor why to avoid them let's see the definition a database cursor is a control which enable iteration over the rows or records in the table so if you have 100 rows in a table with the help of cursor you can iterate um, uh, each row one by one so that is the cursor so you if you are if you are aware about the for loop in the similar way you can use cursor in the way you use for loop in the c sharp let me show you here is a sample cursor okay so what we have done here is it's a five step process we have first declared it we have let me tell you sorry so we have first declared the cursor here we have declared the cursor then we have opened the cursor so like here we have opened the cursor then the next step is to fetch each row record using while loop so this is the fetch which is the third step and this is the while loop we are using to iterate the rows one by one and at last then we will close the cursor and at last we will deallocate the cursor from the memory these are also part of the cursor like in a loop you have uh, uh, you are declaring the variable like in a while loop you will declare the variable then you will start it then you will uh, one by one you will iterate it uh, steps are not generally asked but it is good to know them that how if sometime there is a need then how we can create the cursor uh, at last the next part of the question is why to avoid them the answer is a cursor is a memory resident set of pointers meaning it occupies a lot of memory from your system when you are iterating rows one by one so it is basically consuming a lot of memory and whatever whether it's a sql server or whether it's asp.net server if anything is consuming memory that is not good for performance so that's why you should avoid them because um, it's not good for performance what is the difference between scope underscore identity and at the rate at the rate identity 
first thing is both are used to get the last value entered in the identity column of the table i hope you are aware about the identity column if you are not then uh, you have to go to that question where i have discussed about identity column but so these both of these scope underscore identity and double at the rate identity are used to get the last value entered in the identity column the first the double at the rate identity returned the last identity created in the same session session is the database connection and this is the way select double at the rate identity how we will get the identity on the other hand the scope underscore identity function returns the identity created in the same session and the same scope the scope is the current query or the current stored procedure and here is the way select scope underscore identity uh, by which we can get the last identity normally we mostly use scope underscore identity function inside stored procedures uh, so why we use scope underscore identity uh, suppose you have a trigger on a table if you have a query that inserts a record causing the trigger to insert another record somewhere then the scope underscore identity function will return the identity created by the query while the double at the rate identity function will return the identity created by the trigger so both these values can be different and we are only interested in identity created by the query not the trigger so that's why mostly we use scope underscore identity what is CTE in SQL Server? This very simple definition is CTE stands for Common Table Expression. It is a temporary named result set that you can reference within a select, insert, or delete statement. So it stands for Common Table Expression and it is a kind of temporary table. It's not actually a table, it's temporary result set, you can say. Uh, let me show you the example then you will be more clear see the query here here engineer is the cte okay this is the cte name and that is why we named it name result in the definition because cte has a name now the engineer will contain the data which we will get from this select query okay so this engineer city will get the data from this city query now how to use this engineer city and where to use it like this now this city you can use as a table just next to this uh, when you have created the city after uh, immediately you can use this engineer city like this so see uh, how it will be useful you can use it like a table and uh, you can apply multiple filters here in the cte body you can apply joins here and then after applying the joins or any any thing you can get the result in a cte and then you can use that cte as a table and in many situations you will need this so that is CTE in, in sql server what is the difference between delete truncate and drop commands this is an important question and in many interviews this question has been asked sometimes they ask the difference between the delete and truncate sometimes truncate and drop sometimes delete and drop but yes uh, you should know what is the difference between all three so let's start with the delete 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 what is delete command delete is a dml uh, just for reminder insert update and delete are dml dml is data manipulation language so when you write queries like insert query update query delete query these are dmls only now these are used to define the uh, what is ddl then uh, ddl is data definition language and it is used to define the table structure like create table drop table so it is related to the table structure coming back to the question 
delete is a dml second thing is delete is used to delete one or more rows of a table it is that simple and delete command can be rolled back so here is the example of delete delete from employees where employee id equal to 7 that will simply delete the uh, rows some rows from the employees table that is delete next is truncate truncate is a ddl so as we have uh, seen that delete is a dml so see delete is a dml because delete uh, create uh, sorry insert update delete these are dmls truncate is like a ddl because it works on the structure of the table it used to delete all rows from the table so you cannot apply a filter like this employee id equal to table uh, 7 it will delete all the rows from the table it can be rolled back like delete then truncate sorry the spelling mistake truncate will remove all the records from the table employee but not the structure schema so that is a important thing about truncate that it will if you will write the truncate command like this truncate table employees so first of all you cannot apply where condition with, with this and then it will remove all the data but not the structure like the your columns will be there but not the data then the last one is drop drop is again a ddl like truncate it is used to drop the whole table with a structure and a schema it cannot be rolled back it will remove the structure schema also here you can see this drop statement and see the difference between delete is like delete you can apply the filter but in truncate and drop you cannot apply the filter so this is how delete is different now between truncate and in drop in truncate the table structure will not be deleted but in drop table structure will also go away but there will be nothing remaining of a table if you will apply this drop command and drop command cannot be rolled back but truncate you can roll back so these are the differences between delete truncate and drop commands how to get the nth highest salary of an employee this is a very important question interviewer can ask like uh, how to get the second highest salary third highest salary fourth highest salary uh, but the logic is common try to learn the logic uh, then if uh, time allows then try to remember the syntax but knowing the logic is enough you can explain the logic uh, i think that is enough so let's see so suppose we have a list of salary here and suppose we are looking for third highest salary which is 6000 here uh, i am taking this as third you can take it as second or fourth that is up to you but i think the third it will be good for now so we have here a list of salary and we have to find the third highest salary from it first you have to if it is third first you have to select the top three salaries remember if it is third you have to select the top three salaries now when you will select the top three salaries you will apply this query right select distinct top end salary from uh, table employees order by salary descending so it is salary descending means the highest salary is at the top and the third salary is at the bottom so you will get this result so what you have done first you have selected the top three salaries now the next step is now you you know where is your target your target is here now you, what you will do you will put this result and this top three salaries which like this and this are common right now you will order by it by ascending order so that this 6000 comes at the top so we are putting this in a result temporary table and we, then we are doing it order by so the result will be something like this 6000 7000 and 10000 now the last 
part of the query is to select the top one from the result set see again the middle part is the same here you already result order by and now we are just getting the top one salary from this list and which is what is your expected result and that is the 6000 if you will see the list initially we want to get only this 6000 so it is a short and common logic if you want to apply this on second highest salary you can apply the same logic uh, there are other ways also but i think this is the way which is the common for all and i think if you can explain just the logic here that okay sir uh, first we will get the top three records then we will re uh, put these three records in a temporary table and then we will reverse this and then we will get the top result i think that's the answer you need not to even write the queries because logic is magic what are asset properties this can be a very big topic but i will try to answer uh, what you have to tell the interviewer uh, which should be short and crisp so let's start asset properties are used when you are handling transactions in sql uh, here is a diagram which uh, will show all the asset properties a stands for atomicity which means each transaction is all or nothing which means if inside a transaction they if there are five sql statements then either all five will execute or non, none will execute so that is atomicity basically to maintain the uh, database second is consistency data should be valid according to all defined rules so if you have any data types and you have uh, like integer data type then it should not uh, the value of that column or row should not be string in any condition so that is consistency all the value should be integer only third one is isolation isolation means transactions do not affect each other so if we have two transaction then one transaction should not affect the second transaction they are isolated from each other so that is isolation and the last one is durability 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 means inserted or committed data must not be lost even if there is a power failure in any circumstances the data which is inserted inserted or updated in database should not be lost so in short when you are designing your database then you have to keep these properties in mind for transactions so that your uh, database handling is very strong because data is the most important part of any application what are magic tables in sql server this is not a very important question but sometimes some novice interviewer can ask this so let's see magic tables are the temporary remember it is temporary logical tables that are created by sql server so you need not to worry about it they are maintained by sql server whenever there is an insertion deletion or update operations happen uh, in your database now there are some types of magical tables and they are quite obvious first one is inserted so whenever any row is inserted in your table from any stored procedure or query then this row will be inserted into inserted magical table so this is a type of magical table the name is inserted magical table second one is again obvious if any row is deleted from the tape and a table in your database then this row will be added to the deleted magic table the deleted row will be added to the deleted magic table now you might be thinking that there is a updated magic table but it is not there the updated row get stored in the inserted magic table so if you are updating any row the row with the new value will be inserted into the inserted magic table and the row with the old value the value which was uh, uh, there uh, which was there present previously that row will be added 
the deleted magic table. So in this way, it handles the update operations. Now the question is, when to use magic tables? Because you are not maintaining them, SQL Server is maintaining them. Now when to use them? And you have to use them sometimes in case of triggers. Now triggers, what are triggers and uh, how to use them? I will not explain this because uh, that is not, uh, that will be a long uh, question then. And But seriously, it is not very important question from interview point of view. Might be DBA interviews have something to do with them, but not the full stack developers. So let's finish this here. These are the magical tables. If you reached here, that means you are doing your best for preparing for the interviews. Once again, I wish you all the best for your interview preparation. If you like the video, then please press like, subscribe and bell icon, which will motivate me to create more videos on .NET interviews. Thank you so much for watching.